Hi, it's Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, back with my plans and pans for the week. I'll tell you about the horse in a minute, um, but I wanted to tell you this is my home office. It is also called a dining room, and this is my dining room table where I've been working every day. Um, but it is also, though it may not look like it, um, something like the capital of the United States. That's right, because yesterday I chaired um, a hearing from this office right here. Um, it was um, of my subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the Consumer Protection Subcommittee, and the hearing was the Consumers Beware, Increasing Risks During the COVID-19 Pandemic, Warning People. So it was a real legitimate hearing, official, and in the record. Um, and things like, I really raised the question of the woman who has been nominated by the president to be head of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Her name is Nancy Beck. Nancy has a long history with, um, in the corporate sector, actually working against consumers. Um, she also served uh, on the uh, EPA and favored the chemical industry when she was there, and the Office of Management and Budget when there was a plan for us to open up as a country carefully, and she scuttled that whole, that whole plan. I'm hoping that she won't be, um, nomin that she'll be, that will not be confirmed by the, the Senate. So now about the, the horse. I think many of you know that I am a true animal lover, all creatures, and so are many of my constituents because every week when I get a report of what we're hearing back from my staff, um, from constituents, in the top five, you will find animal welfare issues, all different kinds of, of animals. Um, and I really appreciate that I have um, so many people that are concerned about um, wildlife and bees and anything you can think of in the animal world. But um, today, I was honored with a very special award for me. I used to own a horse many years ago. Uh, that is not the qualification for this award um, and this beautiful, beautiful statue that I was given of a horse from the Humane Society of the United States. And I am now called the Horsewoman of the Year by that wonderful organization. Why? Because I have championed three really important issues. One is to end horse soaring, uh, the most inhumane imaginable practice of actually burning the feet of horses to make them raise their feet higher when they are in shows. We passed it in the House with 333 votes, and now because of the virus, those things are slowed down in the Senate. But I'm hoping, because we have bipartisan support in the Senate too, that we can get that passed and stop the torture, really, of particularly Tennessee walking horses. Um, the, uh, the, the, the second bill that, that I had would end horse slaughter and the exportation of horse meat for human consumption. Two reasons, one, because we don't eat horses, but number two, because it's unsafe to do so. They are not raised for human consumption. In fact, many have chemicals in them from the, the racetrack, it's dangerous, and so we are, you know, we want to pass that bill. The third it has to do with horse racing and would set up a commission to set standards for the literally the drugging of horses. Too much is happening on the day of races, and we have seen really dozens and dozens of horses die every year because they are mistreated when they are put on the racetrack. So I'm very proud of the, the legislation. Those two bills also have many, many co-sponsors. They have not passed yet, but we're gonna to continue to push forward, and we have some real momentum. So I thank the uh, Humane Society of the United States. Um, you've made me very proud today. Thank you. Um, okay, I have a lot of other issues I'm going to go through very, very quickly. 
So we are engaged right now in a school reopening battle. The President of the United States wants all children to, be, to go to all schools, being open, no matter whether or not it's really safe in that particular area for the kids to be going to school. And so to enforce that, what he wants to do is take money away from school districts that refuse to open or that I think even want a bifurcated, some vi uh, virtually, some in school. And so his um, Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, thinks that's a grand idea. So the money that he would take from school districts, then she could use to give to parents so that they could decide that they can send their children to any private school they want that is willing, willing to open. Look. We know that this is different all over the country. Um, some places like Arizona and Texas and Florida have real problems with a spike in the coronavirus. And so it may not be safe in those communities to make that decision and have it imposed upon them by the President of the United States. And really, when it comes to money and funding, it is not even within his jurisdiction. This is a matter for the Congress to decide how much money will be allocated. But of course, he thinks he can do anything that he, that he wants. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the uh, coronavirus. Um, we know that here in Illinois that we're doing pretty well um, compared to, uh, to other states. Um, we found that um, today that there were um, a thousand new cases, um, which is not as good as the average, which is 778. But deaths were down. There were 20, actually I think it was yesterday, there were 20 deaths. Um, the average has been about 24. So we're hoping, it, hoping now that rather, a plat, rather than a plateau, we're going to continue to see those numbers going down. But as you said, in many places around the country, those numbers are going up. And the consequence is that more hospital beds are, are needed, more equipment is needed, and now we're suddenly returning to a shortage situation when it comes to testing, when it comes to that personal protective equipment, the PPE that workers need um, and doctors need and nurses need when they go into um, a, a nursing home or into a hospital situation. And so um, it's, it's very precarious, it's getting worse around the, the country and the president is still pushing, pushing, pushing for complete opening of everything, denying completely that there's a problem with that, and of course providing no leadership whatsoever to make sure that places that need help, that need equipment, are be, going to be able to, to, to get it. I wanted to talk a bit about the, uh, the Supreme Court. We've had a mix of decisions. We had one, a uh, pretty bad one last week, that dealt with birth control that would allow employers now, based on the religious or moral positions that they take as employers, to deny free um, birth control to their employees, something that I thought was very clearly covered in the Affordable Care Act, but the Supreme Court decided differently. We're going to have to move uh, again, I think, to the Congress to make sure that birth control is a, a right of all people, all women, all men, to uh, have access to. Um, then we had the Supreme Court ruling on whether the president has the authority to withhold um, information in a criminal prosecution. And the court basically decided on the rule of law, that, that no president or no person is above the law. And guess who voted in favor of that? And that included Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch, the two justices that the president recent, most recently appointed, he certainly, I think, I know he called them 
his justices, and it, he called it his Supreme Court. Well, he saw something else in this, uh, in this week. Um, the, the downside for many of us is that we think this decision is finally going to come down, whether he has to turn over his um, ta tax records after the election, but it's still very, a very important and positive decision. As you know, the Supreme Court decided a positive when it came to DACA, the dreamers, the young people who are here undocumented but have been here most of their life. But what we know and what we're working on in the Congress is to make it permanent not just up to the president, not just up to the, even the Supreme Court, to put it into law that we protect those young people who are doing so much for our country from deportation. So the president of the United States has an executive order that deals with the issue of foreign students. Now understand our colleges and universities depend a lot on the, those foreign students but so do all of the rest of us. They are doing important work in the United States. Many are involved in important research and, and development and innovation. Um, they're playing a very important role in higher education right now. And the president is saying that if their um, higher education institution does not have actual classes um, not virtual, not online, um, then they have to, these foreign students have to leave the United States of America. Here in Evanston and in, we have no Northwestern in Chicago, we have Loyola, we have these very important um, universities that really are fighting back right now to make sure that we're going to be able to um, keep these students who have meant so much to their universities and to us as Americans. Um, it's really a serious mistake to say that we're, we want to block the, the, the door and instead of opening it to students who want to come to the United States and not only learn from us but contribute to us. Then also, there's something that I really am worried about that I just heard about. I don't know that I think it may have been going on for a little while. That um, ICE, that's the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. You've heard a lot about ICE. They work at the border. They're involved in door knocking and helping deport people from the United States. They are a law enforcement agency, a part of our immigration service. They have set up a citizen, citizen, ICE Citizens Academy where they want to invite people who are so inclined to take a six-week course on how they can be helpful to ICE and learn things like firearms familiarity, like targeted arrests. It feels to me like um, you know, some, some sort of a vigilante organization that the government is offering to, to people. And guess where they're coming next? To Chicago. And we think the reason is that they want to target what we call sanctuary cities, cities that welcome immigrants because we are certainly not only a country of immigrants, but particularly we have a very diverse population here in Illinois and certainly in, uh, in districts around the Chicago area. So I'm very worried about that. We have to look into it. We haven't done a deep dive on just exactly what this um, ICE Citizens Academy is about. And finally, I want to say this. We've all heard that it looks like Russia has been funding the Taliban to murder Americans, to kill Americans. And we have heard nothing from the President of the United States about that. So we are going back to uh, Washington, and maybe even before we go back, having um, investigations, hearings about this practice. We want to make sure that we know exactly what is going on 
and that we have to hold Russia accountable. And when I say that, I mean we also have to hold the president accountable who doesn't want to ever say anything bad about his friend Vladimir Putin and make any criticisms of Russia. So this, these two things, the ICE Citizens Academy and the funding uh, by Russia of murderers of our troops, our troops that are in danger. So we'll talk more about that, and I will see you next week. Thanks. Thank you for watching my video. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where my handle is at Jan Schakowsky.